Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Before actually getting started, I do need to do one more one hour makeup. You've got Latin class. Anybody else got Latin class? Oh, so it's Friday lunchtime, okay? I hate Friday lunchtime too. Okay? Okay, Friday lunchtime? Come on, okay, and I'll. Try and remember to send out an email about it, and tomorrow I'm hoping to get organised. Now, those of you who've seen my office will immediately say that's impossible. Uh, but I hope to get organised and start getting slides on uh, Moodle for you all in the proper order. I'm beginning to understand the textbook myself now. I, I've started reading it, uh, so I can, I'll try and make things fit better. Uh, there. I'm surprised actually at some of the things the textbook doesn't mention, or I may have just missed them going too fast. But um, as you will be aware, I'm also, apart from giving you extra information, I'm treating each chapter in a slightly different way, uh, a way which seems more logical to me. And that's why I'm going to start off today with uh, this slide, uh, the slide of the building known as Maison Carré uh, in Nîmes, in modern France, uh, to make the point, which the textbook doesn't really stress, that under Augustus you get a lot of use of the Corinthian order at Rome. The Corinthian order of architecture, very elaborate uh, capitals and often a frieze along the top of the building, is something that's very typically Augustan. And we find the Corinthian order being used in almost every building that uh, Augustus is responsible for at Rome. Its popularity at Rome, it's fashionable at Rome, so people outside of Rome want to copy it as well. And we find several temples outside of Rome and Italy, uh, some of them incredibly well preserved, which use the Corinthian order. Uh, temples which are normally built by or on behalf of Roman, settle, Roman citizens in a community, sometimes a colony, sometimes not. This is what we have, for example, at Nîmes, the Maison Carré, uh, a building constructed in the local limestone. Now, there is no marble available around uh, Nîmes, so we have this particular temple in the local limestone. Uh, it's built in honour of Augustus's two grandsons, Lucius and Gaius. We know this because originally there was a series of bronze letters along the front which gave us that dedication, but they've all been stolen. Well, the Maison Carré survives incredibly well because it was converted into a church. But looking at it, of course, you can see this is a typical Etrusco Italic temple. It's a very good example of one. It's hexastyle. It's got six columns along the front. It's got a very deep pronaus. And it's got a series of engaged columns along the side. And we'll look at some of these in a bit more detail. But look at that very high podium with the steps at the front. Here we have the plan. So you see the six columns at the front, hexastyle, typical for a Roman temple. The engaged columns going along the sides and also at the back. Uh, this is the view from the back. Not terribly easy to get a good photograph of this. But you can see the scale of this. Those are not two little boys. Those are grown men climbing over it. The podium is, is just about four metres high. Not built of concrete, of course. This is built in opus quadratum. Using square blocks. And if you look at the top there, well, let's have a better look. Marvellous example of the Corinthian order. This is what Augustus likes in Rome. This is what people outside of Rome decide to copy. And wherever people could afford to build a nice Roman-type temple, this is what they did. We see the same sort of thing at a place called Vienne, not Vienna, Vienne. Although actually Vienna was its name in the Roman period, it's Vienne in, in France now, 
But a Roman name for Vienna in Austria was Vindoblada, so uh, you can get very confused. Don't get too confused. But again, what we're looking at here is a hexastyle temple, six columns along the front. This is a rather odd temple in many ways. It is to Augustus and his wife Livia. Uh, because why it's odd is it's got these series of freestanding columns along the side. Most Roman temples, columns at the front, engage columns along the sides. The Capitoline Temple in Rome has a row of columns along the side like this. There are no columns along the back, but this is rather more closely modelled on the um, Capitoline temple than uh, anything else. But again, a wonderful temple in the Corinthian order. We're looking at the front of the Pronaos. These holes are where the bronze letters were originally uh, that told us it was dedicated to Augustus and Livia. Again, it's built of the li local limestone. These are two of the best preserved temples, but don't think that these are the only well preserved temples set in the Roman Empire. This is Pula in modern Croatia, a temple dedicated to Augustus. Pula, a smaller settlement, they're not quite so rich, so they build a Tetzva-style temple. You've got four columns along the front in this particular case. But again, it's in this good sort of Roman, Etrusco-Roman style, the steps at the front, the four columns, the very deep pronouns. A bit shady here, I didn't want to get the crane in, but you can't avoid the crane, it's a shipyard right behind there. But you can see that the side of the temple is perfectly plain. This is what you would normally expect to see in a Trusco roman temple, only the very elaborate ones have engaged columns, uh, or even freestanding columns. Um, this type of temple was really built all over the Roman Empire, wherever there were Roman citizens. So, for example, Antioch by Parsidia, not far from modern Berda, restored appearance of what we have there. Again, a Tetra-style temple, a Tusco-Italic temple. Restored appearance because there isn't very much left of it on the site now. Uh, everything went to go and build the town of Berda down in the valley below. Well, these temples, they're built in the traditional dry stone method. There's no cement, there's no mortar holding the stones together. They're held in place by their weight and they have clamps to hold one block of stone to the next block of stone like that. So these are typical opus quadratum dry stone construction. The thing is that in many areas in the Roman Empire, you don't have the right type of sand to make concrete. So therefore you have to do what you can with what there is available. Within Italy though, during the Augustan period, the idea of concrete architecture is spreading more and more. It's, but it's, people are beginning to start experimenting more and more with concrete architecture. And our first real evidence for a major development in Roman architecture is in Campania at a place called Bay, where architects managed to make the first dome out of concrete. Well, the idea of trying to make a circular building with a beautiful circular dome type roof on it is a very old one. The normal method of building such a dome we see in the Bronze Age in Greece was the method we know as corbelling. Now, I put this slide on really to explain the principle of corbelling. One long stone like this, one up like that, one like that, one like that, all the way up. You can overlap these stones and bit by bit build a dome. This is a tholos tomb in, in Greece. Uh, dating to the Bronze Age, you can't see the stonework, but it is a corbel dome, a circular structure, the dome made using corbelling. But down in Campania, sometime under Augustus, it's thought sometime before 19 BC, but there's no precise date and evidence. Architects at Bae managed to make this. It's called the Temple of Mercury. It's not. 
it's part of a Roman bathhouse. Now this whole area is subject to earthquakes and ups and downs and volcanic eruptions and so the Temple of, of Mercury is filled with water now. Not quite, but quite a lot of water. So I've put on this 18th century view of the interior so you can get some better idea of the size of it. At this particular time in the 18th century, the ground level was more or less the same. But unfortunately today, the ground has sunk down, water level's gone up. So we see the dome right from where it actually starts. Now this is 21 and a half meters in diameter. This is much larger than we see anything being built at Rome until the Neronian period. So it's a rather exceptional piece of architecture. It's got the opening in the top, the oculus, which means the eye. Um, the oculus, yes, it's partly intended to give light to the interior, but not totally intended for light. You've got windows in the side of the dome for that. The idea of the oculus is to reduce the weight of the material in the dome. By about 5% or so, you reduce, you reduce the risk of it cracking. So this is the uh, earliest concrete dome uh, that we can point to. Um, in the rest of Italy under Augustus, architects are less willing to experiment or try uh, new types of architecture. But what we do find is concrete being used increasingly for bridges and aqueducts and things like that, which brings us to the next part of the textbook, uh, Augustus's Via Flamina. The Via Flamina, built by Augustus to connect Rome to the east side of Italy. I made the point in the first week that it's very difficult to actually go from west to east across Rome. Uh, the Via Flamina is the first real effort at trying to do that. We get the uh, Via, Via Sabria a bit later. This has to cross a number of deep valleys. And wherever possible, they avoid a valley. Where they have to cross a river, they cross the river where the river is not too deep or where it's not too deep a valley. But in some places, and this is true at uh, a place called Narnia, where the, river has to, where the road has to cross the river Nair, a bridge had to be built. And this was a challenge of a bridge building episode as well, because the bridge had to be built from a low level on one side to a much higher level on the other. This again is a 19th century, uh, or in this case a 19th century drawing that shows you the remains with a reconstruction drawing here. But this is not really made that clear in the textbook. That this, this is not a simple matter of building a straight bridge across a wide river. This is a bridge that has to rise from one side to the other like that. What makes it possible? Concrete and the arch. Very deep arch, more or less a barrel vault in this particular case here. But it is just that significant thing about concrete. It revolutionizes architecture. We might hate all the concrete buildings we see today being built everywhere, but it was a revolutionary material uh, under Augustus. This is looking at the other side of the bridge abutment. The end of a bridge is called the abutment. And we're looking at the other side of that very well-preserved one. And you can see this is functional architecture. It's meant to work. So they haven't really bothered trying to tidy up the stonework. It's been left with that rather rough appearance. This is what we know as rusticated masonry. And we'll be looking at more rusticated masonry in a couple, ooh, next week, I think, uh, when looking at the architecture of the Julio-Claudian period. Concrete, also used to build the arch at Rimini that marks the end of the Via Flamina. The arch of Augustus, as it's snowing, we've still got parts of the inscription left in place. This is medieval Renaissance work and that's a Renaissance uh, uh, defense wall there. But a very beautiful arch, it's concrete with stone on the front. You know, it is the great advantage of concrete architecture. You can do it on the cheap. 
The only problem I find with this particular approach is that many modern architects, and you can see this a lot around Bill Kent, will then put the stone on the front of the building in nice square blocks like that, making it look as if that's how it's built. No building made of stone would stand up more than two seconds. You have to overlap the blocks like that. So whenever you see a building like this around Bill Kent, you know it's concrete if you didn't know it was concrete before. The Arch of Rimini, a fascinating piece of sculpture. Um, lovely little pediment, triangular pediment on the top, Corinthian architecture uh, columns. These columns are engaged columns. They don't serve a functional purpose. They are purely decorative. They're just there to sort of break up the overall scheme of the uh, gate. And we've got these little areas here, these little medallions in that curving part of the arch. The part of the arch we know as the spandrel, and that's a word that will come up again, and it will be on the, the slides when you look at the slide of the arch there. Uh, it's thought that these are portraits of Gaius and Lucius, uh, but nobody's really quite certain exactly who they were. But the Pax Romana, the spread of knowledge of how to make concrete throughout the rest of the Roman Empire, very much so under Augustus, wherever there was suitable sand, and it has to be a volcanic type sand. Wherever there was a suitable sand, people start putting up concrete architecture. And we see this very clearly at a place called Augusta Emerita. It's a colony founded by Augustus for, as a home for his retired soldiers. We've got a lot of buildings in Augusta Emerita which do date to the Augustan period, as with, for example, the theatre there, which was built by Agrippa on behalf of Augustus. The modern, uh, the, the modern name is Merida. Modern Spain is almost on the border with Portugal, so it's in that western part of Spain, more or less northwest of Madrid. Good example of an early Roman theatre. Remember, Roman theatres are D-shaped. They have a high stage building. Now, this is not too high. You've only got two levels here. Often, you will have three levels in the stage building. All the columns here are functional. They do actually hold these bits and pieces up. Characteristic feature of Roman theatres, you always have these three entrances that central large one, usually in a recess. You can see the curve there. That's the principal one. These are where the other actors come in and out as well. Well, this is still used today, as you can see. Uh, but I want you to notice this entrance area here. Remember the theatre of Pompey, its barrel vaults, that allow you to build a cavea, a seating area, in a flat, uh, flat zone, where you can see the cavea here. You've got barrel vaults coming in from the side with stairways going up to allow people to get to that level. Stairways and barrel vaults going further up so people can sit there as well. That's a bit too dangerous for people to sit on today, so um, you don't normally get up that far. One thing about Merida, the textbook doesn't mention is the Forum, and this is a very surprising omission because the Forum of Merida is a copy of the Forum of Augustus in Rome. Not in terms of its plan, but in terms of its decoration scheme. We're looking at what survives of the Forum, the actual Forum space is there, we're looking down a colonnade here, and you can see a series of statues with inscriptions beneath them. We know that the Forum of Augustus had exactly the same type of decoration, a series of statues along the, um, the colonnades, the statues of the great men, the Sumni Veri. They don't survive in Rome, but we can see them in the Forum at Merida. The Forum of Augustus also had a very elaborate decoration on the area above the columns, with these very large circular uh, masks showing different gods 
and standard figures in between them, caryatid figures. Figures of women which serve as columns. Well, there were caryatid figures used in the Forum of Augustus. The Forum of Augustus also has these circular medallions. So the Forum at Merida is based on the Forum of Augustus, and it's important to be aware of the fact we can reconstruct the Forum of Augustus at Rome to a certain extent from what we have here. Another wonderful piece of architecture at Merida um, is it's not one bridge, it's actually a series of bridges. There are three separate bridges that go across the Ridot River Guadalquivir. And the river here is very wide. And in the spring, it can flood and cover quite a large area. And you can see from these little arches here that in really bad weather, the water will actually go up to that level there. Well, this bridge total length is one and a half kilometers in three sections and was still being used to carry uh, transport until they built the new one in the background in the 1960s. Marvellous piece of Roman architecture yet again with rusticated masonry on the side there. These arches to allow excess water to flow through. But not bad at all, 2,000 year old bridge still functioning perfectly well even today. Only used by pedestrians now though. The Temple of Diana, um, which seems, it's, well it's called the Temple of Diana, we don't actually know who it was dedicated to. Uh, it was probably, or quite possibly, a Capitolium, so dedicated to the Capitoline Triad. It might have been a Temple of Augustus, we honestly don't know. Unfortunately most of this has been robbed, so the stairs at the front have disappeared. Uh, what survives is thanks to this building here. Uh, built by one of the Spanish conquistadors in the 16th century. But you can see again this Corinthian architecture, this spread of Corinthian architecture uh, under Augustus. An amphitheatre, well, Romans like the blood sport games. The animals would have been kept in this hollow uh, sunken area underneath here with a wooden floor over it and trap doors to let them come running up. Uh, no, unlike the film Gladiator, the tigers didn't have chains tying them in the corner. Uh, they ran freely around and ate what they could, or fought other animals as well. So we have the, all the things you need for a good Roman town, an amphitheatre, but this is a flat area of land, Merida. So this is all made possible by concrete and barrel vaults again. The two most marvellous features of Merida, though, uh, and I'll explain why these are the wonders of Merida, are its aqueduct, which is known as Los Milagros, or the Miracles, these incredibly narrow piers with support arches, they stand 40 metres high, to carry an aqueduct for a distance of something like uh, one, um, almost a kilometre across the flat valley. They're made of a mixture of stone and brick, all held together with concrete. And why this is so important, and why the people of Merida particularly like this when it was built, was Merida is an area of Spain that is now known as Extremadura. Extremadura, extremely dry. There is very little rainfall there. So Extremadura, uh, to the northwest of uh, Madrid, there were three aqueducts altogether built to supply Merida with uh, water. See, Roman technology, concrete, the arch, you can supply water to a very large city. But you have to store the water, and this is the other great architectural feature of Merida, if you really like Roman architecture. I don't just like art or something like that. It's called La Prosperina. Uh, it's actually a dam. It's a barrage. In the Spanish word is barrage as well. Uh, it's a reservoir about sort of 10 kilometers outside Merida, which stores the water over the winter months, the autumn and winter and spring months, uh, and then it can be released slowly uh, down to the aqueduct. Well, aqueducts, architects, Things like this, sculpture aside, 
The really important thing about the time of Augustus is this, it's a long period of peace and prosperity. We're talking 40 odd years in which we yeah, there are wars, but the people of Rome don't really get badly affected by them. What this means is the fine arts. Now the fine arts, other arts besides paintings or sculpture uh, can actually develop and can be brought to a high level. And this is why we have such wonderful products like this, the Portland vase, uh, which can be dated to the Augustan period. It's about that high. It was found in the tomb of, I can't remember which one, one of the third century emperors of Rome, but the Augustan date is pretty certain on this. It's a wonderful piece of workmanship. As you see it now, you can see a few cracks in it. In the 19th century, somebody went into the British Museum with a hammer and smashed it into 256 pieces, which then had to be stuck together again. But that's why you've got these cracks here. This is basically a piece of blue glass which has been blown. The normal way you make glass. Then they've coated it with a white glass. The white glass has then been carved down to produce this cameo effect. Cameo is normally made of stone, but made of glass in some cases as well. And you can see they've got this wonderful carving showing what is evidently a mythological scene although nobody actually agrees on what the scene is. Uh, the general agreement is it shows the scene from mythology about a mortal called Peleus. Peleus, a mortal man who fell in love with Thetis. Thetis is one of these um, sea creatures. She's a divine sea nymph. And, and the, the story is that eventually the gods take pity on them and allow them to get married and they have a son, hooray, who is Achilles. See, the gods don't work in mysterious ways. The gods have got everything worked out beforehand. They need an Achilles for other things to happen. So this marriage has to happen here. Well, on one side, what we see um, is Thetis, and this is Aphrodite, and Hermes watching over her. They're symbols of love and marriage. And then on the other side, uh, we, we have the, the scene whereby Diana Aphrodite sends Cupid down with his little bow and arrow on February the 14th, or an appropriate day like that. Thetis sort of sees Peleus and goes, oh, you're such wonderful. I've fallen in love with you. There's a sea creature hiding behind her. And this person over here uh, is, must represent um, Poseidon, uh, the god of the sea, who's actually given his permission to the marriage to take place. Glassware doesn't survive terribly well. There are some wonderful examples of glassware. Um, when it was possible to go to Syria and walk around some of the Syrian cities, you would be surprised at the amount of Augustan glassware that were offered for sale. Um, but what does survive, in slightly more numbers, more expensive, things like silverware. Well, this is a typical silver cup of the Augustan period. Most of the silverware that we have from the Augustan period was found either at Pompeii and Herculaneum or it was found in Germany at a place called Hildesheim. A group of Germans have managed to kill a large number of Romans at the Battle of the Teutoburg of Auld and took the silver away with them. And we find a wide variety of scenes on Augustan silverware. It's all wine drinking cups, basically. Um, but you, you do see the influence of this uh, Arapakis type architecture to a certain extent in the use of these long tendril patterns. Remember the Arapakis? You've got the vine and the acanthus scroll going all over the place with lots of little flowers and little birds in them. Well, you've got the same general impression coming out here. Um, although there's no obvious swan of Apollo in this particular thing, but it's the same type of uh, overall pattern. That looks to be a pomegranate, but I can't be absolutely certain. 
This is just one more example. This is a much more common type of uh, silver vase that you would, or cup that you would see. Very heavy detailing here. Um, in this case, it seems to show um, a, a laurel wreath. I mean, you, you, it looks as if you've got olives uh, hanging there. Uh, it's not entirely clear what that one is. <coughs> Textbook does draw attention to this one, or rather these two, the Boscoriale cups. Both found at the Villa Boscoriale, not too far from Pompeii, covered when Pompeii was destroyed in an eruption. These were both destroyed in the Second World War, when the museum they were in was bombed. Copies do exist. I've never been able to get a photograph of the copies, but most of the time, what I've had to use are the pre-Second World War photographs here. What are Boscorial, Boscoriali cups? Um, bring us back to this idea of Roman art using history, using art as propaganda. So, for example, on this one particular cup, what do we see here? Well, we see a seated figure. We can identify him as uh, Augustus. Uh, he's receiving a statue of victory. He's holding an orb, which represents the, the world. So, victory is being given to him by Venus. Cupid, by the side, so it has to be Venus. So this scene symbolizes the fact that Augustus has brought peace to the world through his military victories, his own, and victories on other people's part. But remember, Venus is the mother of Aeneas, who is the father of Julius Suscanius, the ancestor of the Julian family. So again, it's pushing that little bit of Roman mythology in. On the other side, you've got Mars. Mars is the father of Romulus, but also the boyfriend of Venus. So, you know, he's repeating that message that we've seen in the Arapakis one more time, stressing this semi-divine connection. The other side of that particular cup uh, shows us Augustus sitting on, on a chair here. He's surrounded by a group of men with long sticks. These are the lictors. The lictors are not so much the bodyguard, they're the assistants of the emperor. They're the guys who walk with him and get out of the way, get out of the way, get out of the way. That's what the long sticks are for. Nothing to do with the fascists or something like that. But it's because we have the lictors here, we can identify this as Augustus again. Well, Augustus is sitting down there and he's receiving a man who's kneeling, he's wearing baggy trousers, uh, long hair and a long beard, like I had until the weekend, uh, not quite that long. This is a, a symbolic barbarian. He can be a northern barbarian, he can be an eastern barbarian. It, this is Augustus receiving the surrender of the barbarian people. It's connected to the message on the other side. The second of the Boscoriali Cups shows us a scene of somebody coming back in triumph from a military victory. We can recognize this as Tiberius. He's standing in a chariot for a triumphal procession. Behind him, by tradition, there would be a slave holding the victory wreath over his head and saying, remember, you are mortal. You will die one day. Enjoy today while you can. Remember, you are a mortal, and so on and so forth. Well, they're all going in this wonderful victory uh, procession. You can see that man's arm, uh, holding a palm branch there. And then on the uh, other side of... Oh, oh, no, I put this one on. The, the, the textbook doesn't mention this. This is the Gemma Augustea. Uh, this is a cameo. It's a really big one uh, that's now in Paris, which shows Augustus receiving Tiberius coming back from a military victory. It's the same type of uh, procession scene. Here's Tiberius with victory standing behind him, coming out of the chariot. In the Boscoriali cup, we see uh, Tiberius uh, still in the chariot, making his way around the corner. Well, the other side of that cup shows Tiberius coming up to the sacrifice that's being made in his honor in front of the Capitoline temple. This three-legged altar, 
The only god associated with a three-legged altar is Apollo. Who is Augustus? Apollo reborn. Bring in the golden age back to Rome. So you've still got this sort of uh, propaganda message taking place here. You can see a couple young boys uh, around the altar and over here we have uh, the sacrifice about to begin. The victimarius, the, the man who sort of stuns, he doesn't kill, he hits the ball on the back of the head to stun the animal and then these guys down here actually cut the throat and there you see the Capitoline temple uh, shown in the background there. Now for those of you who don't have the new textbook, the next slide will come as a bit of surprise. This is the Warren Cup. This shows you how scenes of everyday life, scenes of historic events, all types of scenes were represented in Roman silverware. It's called the Warren Cup for the guy who owned it. Nobody knows where it was actually found. Silver cup, about that high. I can't remember how much it sold for, but I think it was a million and a half dollars, something like that. But th this shows you a scene from a uh, Hellenistic lifestyle, in which you've got homosexual man here. We're well, not homosexual. You've got an older man having sexual intercourse with a younger man. This sort of reference back to the Hellenistic tradition of older men teaching younger men about life. It's specifically to do with that. Romans didn't like homosexuality, but they accepted this type of homosexuality in a specific setting. So that would be perfectly uh, acceptable for an older Roman. Well, yes, you know, sort of when I was a lad, I went through the same experience. It was all part of learning how to grow up. Wonderful detail, of course. I mean, especially, you know, having to hold on to something in that particular case. But look at the guy there, peeping around the door. Whoa, what's going on in this room here? He's peeping around the door. Uh, the, the other side is, is really a little bit difficult to understand in many ways, but it does seem to be uh, a male and female lovers, although some people think this might be a hermaphrodite, mixed sex. It's not at all clear exactly who this, uh, scene rep what this scene represents, but if you look over here, you've got double pipes, double pipes, and over here, you've got a harp, these are both characteristic scenes from Hellenistic life, from Greek lifestyle, musical instruments used in Hellenistic symposiums. So everything in the Warren Cup is making that link. This is Greek. This is not Roman. Now don't confuse us. This is Greek. We're not like this. Well, the Emperor Trajan certainly was. Going on from these sort of fine arts into war paintings, the age of Augustus sees really the final development of what we would call a Pompeian second school, uh, second style. Uh, the second style, remember, relies a lot on architectural elements. So you've got painted columns standing on piers like this. Uh, but it starts to introduce this concept of paintings. In some cases, you've got a window type scene. You're looking out through a window onto a garden area. And the wall is painted to represent real paintings on canvas actually hanging on the walls or standing on stands like this. This is the Villa uh, Farnesina, which is believed to have belonged to Agrippa, Augustus's uh, son-in-law. You know, it's a good example of this late second style in which the architectural elements are still there, but you're beginning to see more of an emphasis on looking out into the distance. But you're not pretending this is anything except a wall, so you have a copy of what would be a high quality Hellenistic painting hanging on the wall there. Uh, higher up, the illusion that you've got an open space at an upper level. Uh, more paintings and statues there. Well, this is the illustration that's basically in the textbook, but to put it in context, you need to see this. We were looking at that part there. 
This is the side wall that goes with here. Now notice the big piece missing. That was robbed out in the 19th century. Uh, but the point is, you get these really large panels like this, interrupting the columns in this late second style. And this is where you find this type of seam. This is shown in the textbook. It's a, a woman pouring oil or perfume from a small basket, uh, flask into another one there. Uh, all the detail of this painting indicates this is somebody from the Hellenistic period, from the Greek world. This is a wall painting done in Rome to represent a real Hellenistic painting on canvas. It's that sort of, you know, somebody's got the idea, yes, I want to show in my house an appreciation of the visual arts, so I have paintings of painting, that sort of thing there. I've put this one on, although it's not at all very well preserved, because I want to make the point that where the textbook sometimes misses out little connections that you should really be aware of. This is the House of Livia on the Palatine Hill. We believe it's the House of Livia, the wife of Augustus. The Villa Farnesina is thought to be the home of Agrippa, Augustus's son-in-law. Well, the House of Livia has got the same type of paintings. Not at all well preserved, very badly preserved, but it's exactly the same type of painting. And you've got to be aware of this. You can just see the open scene there. Because what the textbook does talk about um, a bit later is a different type, type of painting in that same house. The Prima Porta Villa, which certainly belonged to Livia, this is where the Prima Porta statue was found. Uh, most famous for this, the so-called garden room scene. This is the final stage in second style Pompeian painting in which the whole thing, the whole wall is just opened up to make it seem as if you're looking when well, you are outside. You're not just looking outside, you are outside. What we have in this detail, you, you know, you've got a representation of a garden fence, a wooden fence. You've got trees growing up like this. A whole variety of plants and fruits, uh, some of them uh, quite clearly in season for representing different times of the year as well. Uh, you've got these lovely little uh, details showing birds, birds which you can recognize today, fruits you can recognize like the apples. This is a nightingale sitting in a bird cage. It's a pet bird, you know, it's that sort of thing. The House of Livia, though, to come back to that, what the textbook wants to emphasize is this particular section of painting. Now, this is what you actually see, unless you're very lucky when you go in the House of Livia. Uh, we're looking along the wall. It's difficult to get a good photograph. We're looking at the curvature going up to the ceiling. But basically, this is Pompeian second style. Uh, it's still architectural. You've got these very thin columns. You've got a vine scroll running along the top, our passes. These garlands in between the uh, columns, inspiration from the Arapakis. Again, the fruits of all different seasons to show peace all the year round. This is a much simpler verse, and it's also in the house of Livia. Uh, I mean, you know, this is architecture that could not work. I mean, a column that thin could not support anything else, but a much thinner uh, garland here. But this is particularly interesting because of these top little scenes like that. Um, they, they're sort of they're landscape scenes. They show you cows, they show you farmers, they show you ruins in the landscape, uh, old buildings, people doing everyday activities. So, you know, just to make that contrast with the uh, other one make you aware that what's in the textbook is very much a selection. And this really does make the point, it's a selection. This is the Villa Farnesina, it's the same type of garland painting. Same type of figured scene on the top there, same type of very thin columns, but basically in black and white instead of white and colours. All of this, of course, ultimately probably inspired by the Arapakis and its garlands there. 
Okie dokie, we've finished there. Wow.